everybody, welcome back to another KiteCast episode. I'm here with my partner in crime, Tim Freestone. Tim, how are you doing today? Hey, good, Patrick. How are you? I am doing well, ready for the holidays. We yeah. have a real treat today. Uh, maybe it's our, our early uh, holiday gift, Ejevne Karam, uh, who has 20 plus years of uh, experience in cybersecurity is joining us today. Uh, it's going to be a really interesting conversation. He promises me, or he promised me ahead of time anyway, that he wouldn't go into too much technical detail because he'll probably lose me and perhaps yeah, certainly him. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you for having me here. Well, it's always a treat. So let's talk a little bit about your background. You know, you've spent a lot of years in network security and you've launched two podcasts recently that are both related to cybersecurity and they're doing consulting on the side. Uh, you know, start off, tell us about yourself. Uh, you know, so I think you I'm doing podcasting. Do I think I'm doing podcasting on the side and consulting is the main business. I spent 16 years working for one of the biggest VARs and MSSPs in North America, private one for her Java group. And I left earlier this year, last year, not this year, July, and decided that it was time, you know, it was a very good time, a lot of interesting things. I learned a lot from Robert and the company. And I was thinking what I want to do. And after realizing that I basically spent so much time working with vendors and in MSSP, why would I not go and consult to vendors and MSSPs? So instead of going and consulting to end users, I decided I will just basically consult to MSSPs, help them to create a better programs, help them align better vendors. In some cases, touch base definitely with end user to guide them there. But it will be down my alley. This is what I did. This is what I like to do. And I enjoy vendors. So I started the second podcast. Let's talk about the first podcast before this to talk to vendors and understand more about their inspiration to start their own companies. And for me, it's basically a way to, to have a networking with new vendors, understand who is coming, also create a better relationship with existing vendors as well. And Cyber Inspiration had 25 episodes at least right now out with many small companies and big companies as well. And I had the opportunity to understand how they work and also potentially to consult them as well. I also consult to one of the vendors here in Canada to help them better with their product and also be their virtual CISO in a way to help them with internal cybersecurity. So this is my consulting business right now. My consulting business is kind of merging slowly with my media business. And three years ago, I had no idea about podcasting. I had no idea how to start a podcast. I had this idea that something I wanted to do. And a friend, Dimitri Reidman, said, told me that he would like to join me in doing, doing this with me. And we started Security Architecture Podcast with the idea to kind of prevent people to have shelfware, to buy product and not deploying them, to have better integration, to have better design, and basically, in a way, unwill what are not in marketing material. So we want to connect the dots between how it's working and what people should ask the vendors as well. So we came with the idea of seasons. Basically, you take a space, let's call it album browsing. You mentioned networking. And we create 10 questions and invite 10, 15 vendors, and each of them will answer the same question. So it's become like a mini RFI request for information. And apparently people liked it. It was very, very technical and it's still very technical, but people like the idea. People that do research in a space found it very, very useful. We probably have the majority of links and videos that covering the SASE, SIC, album browsing, criminal mode access space right now. The last season we're doing right now, finishing, it's about brand new category related to browser security and some browser isolation as well. That people started the company it didn't even exist a year ago, and they were on a show talking about this. And as you mentioned, I did spend a lot of time with networking. I worked in Checkpoint back in Israel before I joined Herjavec Group in Canada. And this is where I learned more about how network is working, TCP IP, all the major protocols. I basically spent two years debugging checkpoint firewalls and going to very, very deep level to understand how everything worked. And then when I came here, I went kind of higher, higher and higher and higher until I move away from working with my hands and now it's mainly speaking. Interesting. Now, all this experience in network security, you know, we hear a lot about zero trust. Uh, it was all about the network initially, and then we started talking about infrastructure, started talking about applications. 
you know, when did you see that shift happen? And then Tim's going to have a question, I guarantee it, in regards to content after you answer that question. <laughs> so me personally, and we had a panel with the Cloud Security Alliance around two months ago, and there were three people on the panel and all with networking background. And all of us in one way or another started to explore the idea of zero trust without knowing it's called zero trust. So I was working during this time and deploying next generation firewalls. And there was the idea that I know who you are, I know who is the user, I know the application, so I can be much more granular on what I can do, not just give you a subnet to IP, I can actually create policy by who you are. Like, this is amazing, let's transform our customers. But then we notice that, okay, I do this towards outbound, but what's inside the company? We have all these routers and layer three switches and people can go anywhere they want pretty much. Why cannot use the same methodology internally? So we started to, to do network segmentation and started the idea of not zero trust, but more network segmentation. And then there came the idea of micro segmentation inside the data center. And then of course the zero trust model became much more popular. John is a friend as well, amazing human being, Chase Cunningham, they all moved it and pushed it to the different level. And right now, of course, we're talking about zero trust inside the network, zero trust from outside to inside the network. And what is the identity space there as well? So there's multiple things that are happening there when what's happening with the data. Do we trust users? Don't, do we don't trust users? If I hired you, why do I don't trust you? And then all these ideas. Yeah. So Patrick teed me up there well for the, the question. Um, so we talk a lot about that evolution of zero trust in that, you know, as you were saying, you got the network and users with, you know, what's least privilege access for users in the network, what's granular controls that you can have on users in the network, external or internal, right? And then there's, then the web applications, right? So network agnostic, the, what applications are in the web and you've got, you know, in band and out of band application controls that you're, you know, plenty of tools like CASBs and things like that. <clears throat> but they always tend to be uh, controls at the technology and the user. Like what's the, what's the control we're putting on the user and the particular piece of technology? And our perspective is that's all great to do, but what's next? And, and the next is putting those granular controls on the assets in the technology themselves, the content, the data, so that it's irrespective of the net. You could have, you know, I'm being a bit, uh, I don't know, grand here, but you could have no network controls and no web application controls. But if the acts, if the data that's being accessed has controls on it, then you can sort of have the, the ultimate layer of protection because ultimately network and applications are there for data anyway. So if you bring the zero trust down to the data and say, this person has least control over this individual piece of data, whether it's in a web application, whether it's behind a firewall in a local uh, server, you know what I'm saying? Like just bringing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I think in the way, if we can refer to this to document security, for example, not always yeah. good example for web, but right. if I created a document and let's simplify it, I have a Google document. I can share this document with everyone because I'm lazy mm -hmm. and I want Patrick and team to edit the document with me. Right. Then it's not a good control and say, oh, but do I need to have access to this document? And what is in this document? Maybe just our menu for the evening. Okay, fine. But in theory or not in theory, practicality, I, I will share this document with only Patrick and team. Mm -hmm. Great. So now we're moving level. Now they have access to the document. But can I really control what Tim Potter can do with the document? They now can download the document and reshare it with everyone else. So I created one level of controls, but then I don't have any control of what you do with the data. Or if I send you this document, this, this document, then you cannot do anything. But when we're talking about document security, when I actually can create a granular control, not just who can access to the document, but what you can do with the document, That's printed, right. sanded, maybe time sensitive. I think it's actually important and it is part of zero trust. I think it's going to be under the data domain. Yeah. There is a number of places, and I think Microsoft is one of them that pushing this envelope as well, with when they acquired a company called Island around five, six years ago and created their own AIP, Azure Information Protection. 
and there's other companies in the space as well. Me personally, actually, I can share your link when I, I was writing about document security around probably 18 months ago. Then I think this will coming in five years. The problem right now in my mind is not the technology, is the user identification, the ease of use. Because if team need to say that he is team, and the team wants to spend seven minutes installing an agent, doing a retina scan, and putting his palm to actually show this is him. Yeah, yeah. I think that you're right. The user experience often, if it's impeded too much, creates shadow IT. They'll just they won't use it, right? And so sometimes security teams will put policies in that are too granular. And yeah, Microsoft AIP and then um, was it MIP as well? They got a lot of IPs. Yeah. <laughs> That was, um, to your point, you know, I don't know, four or five years ago. And now I think a lot of companies, ours being one of them, has advanced this sort of, uh, let's call it enterprise digital rights management, for lack of a better word, at the asset level to where, you know, you, can't, you can obfuscate the user experience. There's technology now where you can make it so that the user experience is seamless, relatively enough so you can create those controls. And is it is the world perfect? No, but that same imperfection of just the fact that security is security is across network and web applications as well as content. The idea is, is how close to the data asset itself can you put zero trust without impeding productivity? And then what you've done is you've lowered risk as far as it can go. You know what I'm saying? And it's not just productivity. I can tell you personally, when I was working this surgery group, it was driving me nuts at every after every meeting with the customer. The yeah. sales person would say, do you want me to share the PDF and the presentation with you? It's like, yeah, 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 share. And then somehow six months after, we'll come and present. I'm like, oh yeah, the other guy came yesterday and they present the same idea. It's like, how? So ideally we understood that, that the presentation we're sharing with people somehow ended with our competitor desk. Mm -hmm. like, okay, mm -hmm. I can understand in the, in the logical space, but can I easily prevent this? Can I share here is the PDF or presentation? Thank you very much. But they actually not allowed to send it outside your company. Watch it, look on this, send it to your friends in the company, but don't send it. And guess what? In 30 days, I can say bye bye. It's gone. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I I won't because this is a podcast and I won't get into the <laughs> the, pit, the pitch of it too much. But the whole idea is exactly what you said. Put granular controls that are bound by domains, bound by geo geolocations. So if I send something to you, Evgeny, and I say, this has to stay within the domain of uh, whatever the you are, then that person can't forward it, can't, because you're leaking IP. It, that scenario you just gave me is they are leaking IP. And if you if you put the domain around it that says, can't, Evgeny cannot send out of his dot whatever dot com domain, at least then you've got that control, right? And, and can't download, can only view. Because if, it's, if it is really highly um, sensitive, you gotta be able to put those guardrails around that document. Otherwise you're never gonna reduce your risk of exposure, right? So you should do a different show when you pitch and we'll, we'll give you grades how good is the pitch you're saying. Yeah, good, good, good. All right, so your turn, Patrick. Well, I think this is an interesting concept in terms of, uh, we'll stay on this and we'll talk about some of the cool things that he's been doing like this. Uh, uh, ski conference for cybersecurity. I want to hear more about that. Me too. I want uh, to. Hear about it. <laughs> when can we go? Yeah. Um, the concept of controlling at the policy level, users can control it, right? Tim can decide when he shares a document who can view it, who can edit it, who can share it, where it can be sent. But it also has an Uber level, right, where the compliance or the risk management team needs to be able to control that across the organization. You, can you speak to that dynamic, right? We're, we're probably farther ahead in regards to individual users, but we're, we're lagging at that Uber level where we control how everything is sent across the organization. I, I, think, it's, I think it's very similar to the, fridge, the food in the fridge. The kids can decide what they want to eat, but they, they're kind of bound to what's in the fridge, you know? <laughs> because the parents didn't get the food, then not, not, not to get, not, not eat anything else. But joking aside, uh, pretty much all the hierarchy idea, you have like a levels of robots, access control, some other control, root access, admin access. When you create a kind of metrics inside the metrics, inside the metrics what people can do. The same with uh, documents in, in this way, you create 
a policy that describes writtenly what can cannot be done. As part of this policy, you create categorization of internal secret, whatever the, you, you want to do there, usually in three, four, no, no, not much in this. And then you have a template of a document and you categorize the documents and you provide people access on what they can do. But then you have security controls that potentially may disagree with your kind of idea and say, no, this is not a public document because it contains internal information, X, Y, Z, and we're going to switch this document to this level. And then when you send this document or print this document, you have the lovely DLP security controls that say, ooh, what are you doing? No, 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 this stays inside the company. Yeah. Right. In theory, the, when it's working. The, yeah, that would be, uh, yeah, when it's working. A hierarchy of controls, right? The, the the DLP trumps the individual user's perspective, sort of a deal, right? Yeah. Now, now you referenced when you decided to start your consulting business, you looked at possibly working with end users, you know, actual users of the technology, and you looked at MSPs. How do you decide? Gee, MSPs need a there's a there's a great opportunity. There's a lot of gaps in this market. How did you make that decision? You know, what was the rationale behind you deciding to focus on MSPs? I'll give you an interesting analogy that, uh, let's see if it work or not. I like whitewater. So I do canoe and kayak whitewater and recently sap and a bit of rafting as well. And when I was learning whitewater, you basically learn that the water is much smarter than you. You want to watch how water flows in the, in the rocks and you'll always take the easiest path forward. So don't try to outsmart the water because it has tons of years of experience and you don't. And you not always need to fight, you choose to write way or the easiest way forward. And by me working with customers as part of MSSP, I always heard about, oh, we don't have a budget, or we need to have a budget constraint, we don't know what we want to buy. Like, okay, why do I need to go and fight this part? And also there's a lot of other smart people that basically competing on the same level. Why would I go to MSSP and vendors that they already have users, but they need to grow because we all agree that you cannot stay kind of still in the same moment. You need to grow your business, you need to grow your opportunities. And I can provide them an opportunity to grow and increase their business to provide better offering to better experience for their customers. And if my offering is correct, then why would they not use it? Same as the vendors. If a vendor hired, sorry, hired, raised $20 million yesterday, you cannot tell me, Evgeny, I don't have a budget for you tomorrow. It's mean I need to give them something that they need from Evgeny and they will use me. So it's not their problem, it's become my problem to suggest what they want to do. So this was the logic and I like to create, I like uh, the research part and I know the vendor space very well and I kind of staying in the vendor space and I have a podcast there as well. So it was kind of all connected in the same moment and this is what I like that to do as well. Progression. Yeah. So the MSSPs, they're lacking your level of expertise. Do they understand what's happening from a business requirement standpoint with their end customers or they're looking for you to actually come in and help them make that definition? It really depends on the size and level of the MSSPs. Some of them definitely understand, but some of them also don't, just don't have time to do research and create new offerings for their customers. Or they need the guidance or the, some, some of the knowledge I, rate, I have and I kind of created to myself and have the experience to talking with the end user or to potentially navigate with the, with the customers. Or in some cases, there is a potentially competitive information, competitive landscape. How do we navigate this part? Which product will go with? I'm as an architect and I'm by trade an architect. I like the idea of complete picture. I don't want to just choose a product that will be nice and shiny. I want this product to integrate with the rest of your environment. I actually don't like the name based or breed, but I'll be honest with you. I don't think we should use it because it's referring to places where we don't know which hardware we're buying. And right now everything's in the cloud. So we use all the same hardware. So it's everything in the software right now versus hardware components and all in the brain of people. So maybe best people, not best of brain of, of hardware. And in my mind, it's more about the integration and the components of the software that, that this particular vendor has, how it will connect to the rest of my environment. For one customer, it could be vendor A, for other customer, it could be vendor B.
Hmm. Now you mentioned the cloud. The cloud presents new challenges, obviously, when it comes to how data is exchanged, you know, to whom it's sent, how is it stored and so forth. Do you see as we look out, say, into 2023, 2024, that this is going to be a bigger and bigger challenge for organizations as they move more and more in the direction of the cloud? Definitely, and there's a couple of reasons. But just do a step back. When email was invented, or DNS was invented, it was invented for solving a problem. Nobody was actually thinking about the security and how it's going to be used later on for bad. So DNS poisoning was later on. We tried to move to DNS tech and other protocols. Tons, tons of email security problems that we know, all the spam, all the malware, everything going over email. So we created a lot of products to secure our email. Same with the cloud. We, have, we found a lot of ways how cloud can innovate, how cloud can be better. Kubernetes, serverless are making our life better. And then we figured, okay, now we're there, <laughs> we're protected right now. Right. And we, if, if we add the COVID part and the digital transformation, that, okay, everybody going to the moon, everybody going to the cloud, let's go to the cloud as well. Doesn't matter how we have to go there because somebody told us to go. Then we're moving all these components to a cloud with many times understanding are they designed to work in the cloud? Do we need to actually rewrite them from scratch or lift and shift? And when they're there, how do we control the identities, the access, and the other problems we have there? That's why we have all the CSPM products and many, many other products in the cloud that help to protect us. And it also dragging with them another problem. I used to have everything on-prem. So let's say documents, okay, for example, because we spoke about documents before. If I have a share with all my documents on-prem, great, it's on-prem. Nobody physically can actually go and take it, only, only physically. Now, if I have all documents in Dropbox and I have nothing against Dropbox, I think it's an amazing company, guess what? I don't have them anymore. Now I need to trust Dropbox that they will guide them really well. Now, is it just Dropbox? Maybe some kind of small company that created their own product. What about other SaaS companies that now I give them my data and I'm now bound to their SLAs and to their security so we also created another problem right now that in many cases it's, it's like, I think it's easier because we took something that we're not doing really well and gave it to somebody else, but we need to trust them. So we need to do vendor management, vendor assessment, trust this particular vendor will actually guide us and tell us that everything is okay and we'll secure stuff and nobody will access to our data unintentionally or intentionally because. And all this becoming more and more as a problem we need to solve next year as well. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I'm going to start with a, with one and probably move through it. Uh, it's more of a philosophical question. All of all this technology we've gone through in the last 15 years, maybe 20 now, has, uh, agree or disagree with this, is designed to enable business. Like that's the point. The point of technology is to help business be, do business better. More revenue, bottom line, top. That's the whole point. Like without, okay. so. With that agreement, at the same time, everything you just said, all of this new technology is creating complexity. And when you have complexity, it slows business. And so it's almost like to some degree, there's this um, cycle of uh, business and technology life that you get one step ahead, the complexity that's created puts you two steps back, and then you get uh, you you try to solve all the complexity to get one step ahead where you were before, and then there you see what I'm saying, and then you add the security p components to it, which is always in tow. It's always in tow. It's never security driven, right? So then you get complexity from just the security, and so it's sort of like a, how do you balance? How do companies balance the need to use technology to drive business while maintaining it, that it's not too complex to? Uh, so I think I think you bring a very valid and important point, and we always talk right now for the last several years, security by design. So don't don't duct tape the security later on. Try to come up with the security by design when you create the product. Not always it's happening, but we see more and more on this. And in some cases, we say, okay, we're gonna actually outsource the security component to somebody else. So let's let, let's take the example of identity. You create a product that will sell I don't know what kites, okay? online. 
do you need to have your Yanny Patrick and team identity in, in, in the Kite website? Or you may potentially do an SSO with Google, Facebook, or the bank. So right now, you basically, you know what? I'm not gonna take this risk on me. I'm gonna outsource this to somebody else. It's gonna be easier for you to create an account if you trust sure. Google or Facebook, but I don't have this data anymore. And I can do, okay, I need to build a database and, and save other information because beside the user and password, I may need to know what is your size, how big you are, how tall you are, how much you weigh, to make sure the kite is working for you, what is your strengths and what kind of flying you like to do. And I need to save it somewhere. I can create my own database. Oh, now we speak a lot about basically no code, no code products. Yeah. Well, I can outsource it to AWS DynamoDB, for example, or have something else like Airtable. And we have much more options right now to actually outsource some component to do it differently. Of course, we need to trust these components if you want to use this. But yeah. then we may don't not putting all the eggs in one basket. And I'm not saying we shouldn't trust. We should need to some kind of understand who do we trust our data with. We will be able to have a better security for us and for the end user as well. And of course, when we're building new applications and new programs, we have this idea of pen testing. We want to pen test this. Now, if you take it back, pen testing used to be done once a quarter, once a year, quite expensive. So basically a one-time event. Right. For the last several years, we have idea of bounty hunting. So I can put some money and people will constantly try to attack and understand what's wrong with my environment. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things happening to improve the security of the component as well, and a lot of ways to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you bring up another good point there, which is trusting, again, it's just like this whole cycle of zero trust. Third parties, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if you were to apply concepts of zero trust to third parties, well, right now, most of, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is most of the vendors in the third party risk management space are surveys that the you know survey the a vendor that they're going to do and get a score with maybe some technology that can do some automated um, uh, assessments themselves so it's survey and assessments get a score good enough to work with go um, and that just seems like 20 percent of the way to protecting your data from a you know from a third party because it, it you lose the always on monitoring you know again back to zero's trust right I, I think we're going to have a concept of what we call like zero vendor trust. Yeah. You know, basically I mean. uh, not just this part, but I may pass all the scores in your questionnaire and I'll, I'll, I'll reply to your question in a second, mm -hmm. but then let's say Patrick has a company and team is the support person. Do I know if team has access to my data as a support person or the team need to ask me? to actually have access to the data. Because back on the on-prem days, if I have an email gateway, for example, or an antivirus, team don't have access because you just physically don't have access. You need to mm -hmm. ask Evgeny, can we do a share screen? Let me look on the information, collect the support file, send it to me there. Only in very rare companies, they actually told you, by the way, our support has an option to connect to your appliance for blah, blah, blah. And you can say this, in a SaaS, by definition, you probably have access to my backend and doing stuff. And I think this will change dramatically in the next few years when more companies will have the segregation, when they're not gonna allow the support people, the R&D people to have access to your data. You will yeah. need to create some kind of a control, some kind of questionnaire, because why would you? you know, yeah. Why, what is the we, reason? Is, we have, yeah, we have a concept where not a SaaS by design for that very reason, which is as a, as a company, KiteWorks, we, we cannot access our data, our company, our, our customers' data because they, they own the keys. And we just, even if someone asked us to, like the federal government under the Cloud Act, we couldn't access it for that very reason. There's like the zero trust principles. Not, trust yourself and no one else when it comes to your data, right? Yeah. And I think that will, I think that will become the, the rule, less the exception in the next five years as well, like you said. And taken to the next level, the questions about third-party vendors, it's not there, but I think the insurance companies will help it as well. The same idea as the insurance companies for driving ask us to put as uh, like a 
device in our car to see how well we drive and then de decrease our, our rates, we yeah. may have a similar devices as a vendor or as a SaaS party in the companies to basically show that you comply to what you claim you're doing. Right. So you claim yeah. you have a firewall, you claim you have an antivirus, you claim you have a backup. Can you actually prove it? Right. I, we're not there yet because people don't want it, but we have small kind of steps forward. But for example, some companies create a shareable questionnaire. You know, you upload it once to a vendor, and then when every vendor wants it, they're gonna share it with them. And of course, we have companies like TPRM that check your posture outside and always mm -hmm. change it, but it's towards outside. Inside, mm -hmm. we they don't really know. If the company mm -hmm. has two data centers and now has one, they maybe can understand by external IPs, but it's very hard. Yeah, but if yeah. you do not do backups, and then the light moving from green to red, it's really hard to know if yeah. the company don't have a way to collect it and kind of push it up the chain. Self-attestation is almost the equivalent of the fox guarding the hen house in many ways. So your point about some type of SaaS vendor that you can overlay to verify that the self-attestation is actually true, I could see the validity behind that. That's 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 quite pertinent. Like this, the entire SOC to compliance is focusing on this part. Not perfectly, but doing a relatively good job. Maybe there is, and, and a lot of the SOC to companies that are helping you to create compliant, they have automations that connect to certain parts of the environment to actually say that you have the right controls and the right evidence. So maybe this part eventually, by agreement, of course, people will push it up and say, yes, I'm doing this. Is there yeah. a valid role for the MSSPs to come in and help? Uh, certify or valid validate that these controls are in place and moreover I assume you're seeing in the companies you're consulting with or the MSSPs you're consulting with they have a lot of more end users that are finding that they do business with certain entities that have compliance controls in place say it's a DOD and CMMC and suddenly they need to vet their entire supply chain because their ability to comply with that regulation is contingent on their supply chain actually being compliant is that going to be a, a, a greater and greater pressing concern as we move forward into 2023 and beyond? So many companies doing gap assessment in any case already, and MCSPs as well. There's also a relatively new domain of products that's called breach attack simulation that will assess some of the controls. So we're not giving scores, but they will assess, hey, can I actually take this file and email it to someone? Is your WAF is actually working? So the more testing of the controls, but the gap analysis kind of testing, hey, where you are right now, where you're supposed to be, or the readiness assessment that people do towards SOC 2 or NIST or anything else as well. And I think it's all part to become a better company and have a better metrics to see that you're moving up and not moving down in your cybersecurity program. Hmm. Makes a lot of sense. All right, let's talk about the, this uh, ski cyber conference that uh, you're leading right now. Let's do how it. How did it originate, number one? Uh, number two, what is it? And number three, how do uh, Tim and I get invited to attend? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. So last year, I was doing a snowboard training level one because I want to teach my son and I realized I suck in teaching. So I said, okay, I'm going to go learn and figure out how to do it correctly. It was amazing training. I learned a lot. They had the entire idea of building blocks that I like a lot in our industry as well. And when I done with the conf with the training, I'm like, why we don't do fun events on this hill? Why we do golf tournaments? But people <laughs> like like skiing and snowboarding, why not? So I kind of went on LinkedIn and asked the question and I get a lot of responses. I'm like, yeah, it's a great idea. And like, oh yes, one company did it in one point. It's like, okay. But it was end of the winter. And the, but the idea stayed in my head. And in the beginning, of the winter, talking about probably October, I was talking to people, started my consulting business, and one friend, Tony, Tony Evgeny, I actually part of a private club in near Barrie. It's a it's a city near Toronto on our drive. And I think we can do it. I'm like, no way. He's like, yes. Because in my mind, I like I have no idea how to actually go to a ski hill and say we're gonna on the hill. So he went and spoke with them. And we realize we can actually do it. We realize because it's a private hill and it's opening on the weekend, if we go Thursday, we were able to have the entire hill to ourselves. 
Now, don't get me wrong. This is not a rocky. This is not vast. It's a, not a very big hill, but it's still a hill with different triants, green, black, and blue. And we are looking to do it. Now, the assumption was is, okay, people want to go ski and networking. People right now always going to conference and, and they say the best part of the conference was the talking in the hall with other people. So would it be smart to go a conference and pack the entire day of speaking engagement? Probably not. But we don't want people to mingle and talk to each other and learn each other better. So the idea will be, okay, we'll give people food in the morning. We'll do some presentations during the lunch when they eat. We'll let them ski and snowboard more. We have some games and then we're going to have pub dinner and uh, food and drinks. And we're going to have some kind of panel discussion with a focusing on customer experience and kind of let people enjoy everything. So we're right now looking for sponsors, for vendors to do it as well. It's quite hard to pull by ourselves. We started the registration. We have around, I think, 15, 20 people by now. Probably by the time it's airing, going to be much more. The venue can have 200 people easily. I think 150 will be a very good number to have there from kind of logic and understanding. It's March 2nd, so we want kind of end of the winter, but still not and full end. It's Thursday and uh, it's quite easy to get in there. We can put a link. We can talk to you with Patrick and team how you guys get in as well. We right now working towards accommodation across the street of the hill to stay there as well. There's a hotel right, like literally 200 meters away from the, from this hill to have a better rates. <sighs> I hope I answer all the questions. <laughs> so someone listening to this podcast, how do they find out more information and where do they sign up? So I'll put, uh, if you guys can put in a show note an, an event, or they can just go to my page and my page probably gonna be bombarded by the promotion of this information. But there is a LinkedIn page to sign up and there is Eventbrite link to kind of get the tickets as well. We're not asking for a lot of money, but we want people commitment to come because it's quite a lot of things to me happened and we cannot have 500 people saying they're coming and only 100 to, to, to come up. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but is, was this the first one you're doing or had you done this a little bit before? It's the first event I'm doing myself on this level and I'm pretty sure it's the first skiing and snowboarding event I in Toronto, are. Toronto area was, I know for a fact there was events in Colorado in the past, but oh, okay. in Ontario, Toronto, in Canada, I think this is the first one. All right. Good. That makes sense. So for your two podcast shows are, are on different subjects. So they're covering different, different materials. So they're both worth watching. Where can our audience, and we'll obviously put this in the show notes as well, but where yeah. can our audience find out more information or subscribe to those two shows? So security architecture, quite easy to find security-architecture.org. This is a very technical one. We are finishing season four right now about browser security browser isolation. This is one cyber inspiration. It's if you, if you write cyber inspiration podcast, you're able to find it as well. Or on my LinkedIn profile, there's links to both of them. And cyber inspiration is again, focusing on the people ideas and why, what, what was their motivation to start the company? I had some very interesting interviews with amazing, amazing tips from the founders. What's the most interesting founder interview you've conducted so far? Any, any big surprises there? Oh, this is going to be unfair to some people, but I can tell you one of the biggest things that I like from the recommendation perspective, there are going to be two. One, it was from Dean from Axonios. I was asking about what you can recommend or what will be your advice to people that is starting entrepreneurs. Oh, oh, sorry. I was asking him when you have like a dark moment, like how do you kind of go back to yourself as a founder? And he told me, Evgeny, I was doing one of the interviews with Elon Musk and he was asked, what would you recommend to entrepreneurs during this dark time? And Alan says accordingly that if you're an entrepreneur and need encouragement, you're in the wrong business. Hmm. Yeah. That's and I think it's true. very, 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 very deep. And the other one, it was with Vishav. He's a VP of uh, Sky High. We were talking about sales. And he told me about an idea that somebody else was teaching him that you finishing a sales call and the customer tell me, oh my God, oh my God, I want this product. I want this product. And you want to validate if it's actually true or it's a full of shit. 
tells them, we're going to be so busy, we cannot meet you in, in two weeks, we can meet you in six months. <laughs> and if the customer tells you yes, yes, then it means they actually don't want the product. <laughs> They're just basically busting your balls. And yeah. I say, no, 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 no. We need it earlier. Then you know, actually, truly, we have a real deal here. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, um, uh, they also have along those lines, like, you know, just from a sales standpoint, you know, if the customer says they're always interested in what the innovations in the industry are, take it as a, a red flag because it means they don't have any sort of project. They're just going to sit there and learn from you and one year later, right? We're kicking tires. Yeah. <laughs> so, when I was in the surgery group, one of the questions I will ask, always ask the customer, I'll say, Mr. Customer, just to understand from a deployment perspective that I want to make sure my team is aligned. When do you want to deploy it? Mm -hmm. This quarter or next quarter or Q4? And mm -hmm. the customer tell me, oh, yeah, we need it right now. Oh, well, no, we're just checking right now. We need it in Q4. And I think it's totally valid and good answer, but at least give an understanding yeah, how yeah. urgent is this project. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. Evgeny, we really appreciate your time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. It's always fun to talk to others who have uh, podcast programs on uh, similar topics as ours. Uh, and then you have uh, two plus decades of experience in cybersecurity. So thanks for your time today. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thanks a lot. For anyone who is listening to today's podcast, you want more information on KiteCast, check us out at kiteworks.com slash KiteCast. Thanks for, call, for joining us today.